What a field day for the heat down there A thousand people in the street Singing songs and they carry it time Mostly saying hooray for our side There's battle lines being drawn Nobody's right if everybody wrong When people speak in their mind Getting so much resistance from behind We got to stop children, what's that sound? Oh, everybody looks good and down everyone, this is Lauren Steiner. Welcome to today's edition of The Robust Opposition. This is one day after Earth Day, but it is still Earth Week. And to celebrate Earth Week, I am with my guests, Winona Hodder, who is the Executive Director of Food and Water Watch, and Mitch Jones, who is the Policy Director. So my first question to you, Winona, is, did you participate in Earth Day 50 years ago? And do you remember what you did? Well, you know, I have a really clear memory of Earth Day uh, or the time leading up to Earth Day, actually. I was just about to be 16 years old. And the first time I heard about Earth Day was from a math teacher who was railing against the ecology movement. And I used to try to get my hands on at an underground newspaper called Quicksilver Times. And I remember reading an article, in fact, there was a debate going on about whether Earth Day was an attempt to divert um, people, students away from the anti-war movement. That's interesting because I remember um, that I participated in Earth Day. I was uh, 12 and uh, I wrote this poem that I ultimately turned into a song called Vote Yes on Proposition Life. It was about the environment and it was also about peace because also in that year, I uh, circulated a petition for the McGovern Hatfield Amendment to end the war. So I think you could do both in that uh, generation, right? I think you could. And I actually think that uh, Senator Gaylord Nelson, who really proposed um, a teach-in for Earth Day, he was an anti-war uh, activist too. So I think he was well-intended. But those were the kinds of conversations that were going on. And I was pretty young, but kind of an observer of what was going on. What was the environmental movement focused on during those first decades before Bill McKibben's The End of Nature came out and we learned about the dangers of, of global warming? And what were you working on in the 70s and 80s? Well, you know, I remember very clearly when the Clean Water Act uh, passed in 1972. You'll remember that Richard Nixon actually vetoed it and Congress overrode that veto. And um, George McGovern, who was going to be Nixon, he was Nixon's opponent in the election that fall, called Nixon mean-spirited. Water issues were very, very hot. What I got involved in in the 1970s was the anti-nuclear movement, which was kind of where I think a lot of the anti-war activism went uh, after the end of the war. And the anti-war, or rather the um, anti-nuke movement was really a pretty powerful movement, stopped lots of uh, plants from being built. And in fact, they had to change the rules to, uh, to be able to um, finish some of the nuclear power plants. You used to be able to do kind of like we do fracking now. There was state permitting um, that allowed projects to be held up. And then in um, 1979, when Three Mile Island happened, um, I got pretty active in the movement in um, Virginia where we wanted uh, North Anna to close down, a plant that is still operating um, today. 
Yeah, interesting. In 1979, I uh, was also active in the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, the Clamshell Alliance was protesting the Seabrook nuclear power plant up in New Hampshire and my college, Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. We had not one, but two campsites up there. And I was uh, editing the alternative newspaper, which was very left-wing and political. And um, I had just seen the movie, The China Syndrome. And I wrote an article for that newspaper called The China Syndrome, First the Movie, Now the Mess. So <laughs> That's great. One of the things I thought about fairly recently is we made the prediction that Three Mile Island would be impacted by an earthquake. And it was just a few years ago. Um, dangerously damaged. Well, we had an earthquake here two nights ago uh, that, um, and it was centered in the View Park, um, Windsor Hills area, which is where, uh, you know, as you know, the Inglewood oil field is located. Uh -huh. Now, um, Lucy Jones, who's the person who tracks all these earthquakes said that it was not caused by fracking because it was eight miles down and fracking is only one mile down. But do you have any expertise on that, Mitch, to know if that's a, a logical reason to um, eliminate fracking for the cause of that earthquake? Well, I think it's an argument that the industry always wants to make to try to discount some of the uh, increase in, in uh, earthquakes from being their fault. But you know, once the fractures and fissures are made uh, in the well, fluids go, they don't know how they progress underground. They don't really know what the full um, subterranean impact is of fracking. And so, you know, I'd be hesitant to just discount it having been in some way caused by the fracking in that area just because of the depth. Again, we don't really know a lot of what happens in terms of the fluid and the open fissures and exactly how it all ties together. So Winona, you founded Food and Water Watch in 2005. Tell us why you founded the organization, uh, what was its mission back then, and how has the mission changed, and what accomplishments are you most proud of? Well, you know, I had worked both as a local grassroots activist and for national environmental groups. And my last job was at Public Citizen, uh, one of the Ralph Nader groups. And what I saw was either groups who um, were kind of reluctant to build political power or probably just uh, didn't have um, the kind of sca staff with a background in building political power or at Public Citizen, which is a tremendous group, a great group, uh, was focused mostly on lobbying and litigation. And what seemed to me to be missing was a grassroots component where you really develop a strategy and you go after the people who actually can make the decisions and you build enough power to try to pressure them to change their mind. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I realized that it, to actually do that around the country takes a lot of people, but we wanted to begin chipping away at it. Some of the early issues that we were really focused on was the right to water or uh, the privatization of water resources, which we actually still work on today. And then a number of the food issues that are related to factory farming, uh, including uh, using irradiation to stop um, foodborne disease. Foodborne disease was a huge issue in the early years of um, the 2000s. You know, today, a lot of those issues are dealt with um, because they, they use chemical washes to stop the, the uh, foodborne disease. So, um, you know, about 2008, 2009, we started getting calls about water pollution from fracking. 
And I had worked on oil issues, some at Public Citizen, but I didn't know really much about fracking. So our research department started looking into it. And the first report that we published was called Not So Fast Natural Gas, as we began to uh, look at what the problem was. And by 2011, we had decided this is too dangerous. This is going to be too big. We need to stop it from happening. And we called for a ban on fracking, the first national group. And actually that's what, one of the things that I wanted to do, or we wanted to do, the group of people at Food and Water Watch, was to be able to take big ideas and not to be afraid to call for the things that we really need to happen to fix the environment, to fix our society. And so, you know, we were kind of called names. We were called naive. Oh, you're going to ruin things for the environmentalists who are trying to regulate this. But we were pretty sure that we could work with all of those grassroots groups. And we, we decided to start in New York. Um, which was a state that the oil and gas industry hadn't, didn't have deep hooks in. And by the time that uh, campaign was successful, the coalition that we helped put together, uh, New Yorkers Against Fracking, there were a thousand groups around the state that were um, calling for a ban on fracking. And Governor Cuomo wasn't able to go anywhere in the state without hearing about the issue. And um, so that's one of the things that I'm really most proud of that we jump started the movement around banning fracking. Well, that's how I found out about fracking from Brennan Norton at Food and Water Watch in Los Angeles. And I was working on a campaign called Occupy Fights Hunger. And I had noticed at one of the street fairs that Food and Water Watch had this wheel, this spinning wheel. And at the street fair, the parents would let the kids play this. And it was a great opportunity for Brenna or whatever organizer to engage in the parent about whatever you were activating upon. So I said, can I borrow this? And I went to the office to pick it up. And then I saw all these things about fracking, like these pamphlets that were on, you know, the magazine rack on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what is this? And she explained it to me. And I'm like, oh my God, are you telling me that that is going on right in my city? And I really studied up on it and I got involved with you guys early on and also Californians Against Fracking. I was at that original meeting with all the big green groups and the idea was to you know, decide how we were gonna fight fracking. And Californians Against Fracking spun off because there were several big green groups that wanted to work on regulation. And as you guys know, you, no amount of regulation, no type of regulation can make fracking safe. So I ended up in 2013 running like a citizens led campaign against SB4 which was Fran Pavley's fracking regulatory bill, which was really weak tea. And it was you know, co-sponsored by NRDC, League of Conservation Voters, Environmental Working Group, Clean Water Action. And they really supported that bill, supposedly to, according to them, get a seat at the table. But when um, Jerry Brown asked Fran Pavley to put in these amendments in the last week that would have essentially led to unregulated fracking for two years while the study was being done, like we needed another study on fracking, they said, you know, don't accept these amendments or withdraw your bill. She didn't do it, it passed. And then the next two years, we saw them inject toxic fracking wastewater into drinking, aqu uh, drinking water aquifers 2,500 times. And as you know, Walker and Alex and I and a bunch of other groups participated in a disruption of one of those workshops where they actually were teaching, the regulatory agencies were teaching the oil companies how to get around uh, you know, doing an environmental impact review in order to do that process. And so Food and Water Watch has always been my favorite organization because you do protests, you do disruptions and you don't get behind you know, these 
compromise bills or these bills where they collaborate with the industry, you know, which NRDC has done all around the country. So I wanted to ask you about that question about funding, because you probably saw Bill McKibben's, I mean, um, Michael Moore's movie. I do think he got it right about some of the big green groups um, being totally compromised. And um, I have always believed that it's because of their funding. What is your policy on how funders influence what you work on and the tactics that you take? There's no doubt, and I've seen it over and over and over again in my career in the environmental movement, where funding, usually foundation funding, really impacts what people do. And in fact, I think the whole power of foundations grew, uh, especially after the 1980s with all of the deregulation um, and, and really the wealth creation um, in the stock market and, and changes in law that gave foundations a lot more money. And foundations, from my observation, a lot of them, I'm not going to say all of them because this isn't true across the board, but a lot of foundations, uh, they are there to moderate um, the, the movement, whether it's um, environment or, or other issues to make it um, more in line with the status quo. And so I have worked for groups where I saw an, just an enormous amount of uh, restraint because uh, of foundation funding. And I think the whole thing that really took the environmental movement in the wrong direction you know, really starting um, in the 1980s, especially, uh, has to do with the deregulation that environmentalists would go along with. So a lot of the rules, a lot of the problems that we're fighting with, uh, fighting today, have their root because of deregulation that took place in um uh, especially the 1980s and 1990s. And so I think um, we do see that. And I think if you want to get the kind of mainstream press um, that is easier, um, you know, you have to somewhat moderate what you say. At Food and Water Watch, we don't really let funding determine what we work on, the issues we work on, or the um, positions we take. We don't take corporate money. Um, you know, we're concerned about what's going on with the coronavirus because our strategy is to grow uh, smaller donors and smaller high donors. So I don't mean people giving huge, huge gifts, but you know, people who can afford to um, give multi-thousand dollar gifts because to support a staff to actually get the work done, you have to be able to fund um, your staff. And a lot of our expenses are our staff. So we're concerned about what's going on, but we don't let that upset um, the positions we take um, and as far as tactics, you know, we are committed to tactics that work. And so we don't just do protest for the sake of it, for a protest, we develop a strategy. And when it makes sense to do a protest or to do something that, uh, that might be a, considered a stronger tactic, and we need to do it to put that kind of pressure on the uh, decision maker, we, we do it, but we, um, you know, we have a way of working that involves also doing research and uh, other, you know, they're considered more conventional, but it has to all be part of a strategy about winning. I would say since I've been working on this in the last 10 years, a real shift away from you know, white environmentalists in their ivory towers 
to letting the movement be led by frontline communities, which are mostly uh, people of color, uh, low income communities of color, and also young activists like, you know, the Sunrise Movement kids and, and the youth climate strike kids. Can you speak to that development and how it's played out in your own work? I agree with you 100%. And, you know, our organizing model has always been focused on working in strong coalitions with frontline groups, um, grassroots organizations. And uh, you're right, um, people of color, uh, organizations that are really suffering, uh, especially from the industrial pollution that we see, um, like there in LA with the unbelievable um, oil drilling in people's communities. So, you know, we believe that you have to work uh, shoulder by shoulder with those groups and be very supportive of the environmental justice movement. And we've, we've tried to help in a number of ways, both with resources and also uh, writing reports that actually uh, look at the data and show how um, these communities are being impacted. And I mean, I can't tell you as somebody in my 60s, how thrilled I am to see the youth leadership. And, you know, I think it's exactly what we need. Um, these are the people that are going to be the most impacted by uh, the terrible policies. Um, and so we need to work together and absolutely um, support these groups. And, you know, I think we have some experience that we can share too. those of us who've been in uh, the movement a long time. Speaking of the youth, you and I are both baby boomers, but sometimes I think that we are willing to take tactic, do tactics that even the young won't do. And I'm speaking about actually doing nonviolent civil disobedience, something that's actually illegal, something that is more than just performative, you know, protests, rallies, bird dogging of elected officials. I'm talking about what the tar sands blockade people did when they were protesting the southern leg of the Keystone Pipeline. They actually locked themselves, chained themselves to bulldozers. So I had Varshini Prakash on my show. She's the co-founder of the Sunrise Movement last year. And I point blank asked her if she would ever lead her groups into those kind of tactics. And she said no. And subsequently, I came to learn that they take a lot of big foundation funding. And I kind of wonder if that may have something to do with it. Um, and then I was on their call the other day, uh, what, what to do after Bernie, because, you know, they finally came out and endorsed him. And really, the upshot of the call was that we need to start supporting down ballot progressives. And they were speaking of specific Democrats that were, you know, six Democrats that were running to challenge more conservative, either Republicans or Democrats. And I feel like I dem exited in 2017. I think the Democratic Party is a dead end. And I know you supported Bernie um, and you were probably very as disappointed as I was when he dropped out. But do you really think that, you know, Joe Biden, who is, has, a, has a fundraiser hosted by a fossil fuel lobbyist who told his donors nothing will fundamentally change, who has a, a weak Green New Deal plan, and if he becomes president, which I don't think he can beat Trump, and then there's Nancy Pelosi still in the leadership who called it a Green New Dream or whatever, you know, derisively like that. Um, do you really think that we're going to see the kind of change that we need to get in order to um, attack this existential threat, which is the climate crisis? Food and Water Watch has not endorsed a presidential candidate. Yes, personally, I was a Bernie supporter. Um, and I think here's the difference. Do I like Joe Biden? No. Um, my concern is that I think Trump is an existential threat. And I think the mainstream corporate Democrats are part of the problem. But 
We have to look at them district by district, come up with challengers and figure out a way to take them out because we don't have a system that actually makes it possible to, to elect a third party candidate for president. Not the way the media is organized, not the way our, our um, electoral system is organized. So for me now, um, I vote in Virginia. I will probably vote for Joe Biden because I think he is movable, where I think that Trump is, and we've seen it again and again and again, I think he is so dangerous that I'm terrified about whether we can even make it to the fall. Do I think Biden's a great ca candidate? No. Um, I'm talking personally though. I doubt that Food and Water Watch will endorse a presidential candidate. I mean, we get involved in elections where we can really make a difference. Uh, and those elections tend to be local elections or in some states, state elections. Occasionally we get involved in congressional elections. I think we have to take back the political system. And that means that there, it's a, there's a tremendous amount of state-based and local work that has to be done if we're gonna successfully be able to really change the political system. You know, I'm pretty pleased at the impact that Bernie made on moving the Democratic Party, at least through the, uh, uh, through the um, convention. We all know what will happen um, in the general election. Okay, my final question to you, Mitch, is regarding Food and Water Watch policy now. Uh, I think that recent developments such as the coronavirus coupled with the fight between Russia and Saudi Arabia over oil prices has done two things. One, we've seen oil production uh, plummet 30% um, since the coronavirus started, which has created much less congestion. If you look at the picture behind me, that's Los Angeles without traffic and without smog. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and then the Saudi Russia war caused oil futures to go down to at one point negative value. You know, now I think it's at $11 a barrel or something, which is crazy. Um, Bloomberg actually had an article which said, oh, the prices are so low now, oil companies, uh, environmentalists should be able to buy these uh, oil uh, fields and just decommission them. But then there was another article that said, no, they can't really do that because they don't own the land. They just have the mineral rights and they have agreements with the land owners to pay them even when they're not producing oil. So I was wondering if you could speak to that, um, what opportunities environmentalists have uh, right now and what Food and Water Watch is working on um, as a result of these two developments. As Winona pointed out earlier, uh, Food and Water Watch was the first group to call for a ban on fracking, and we are still working. Um, you know, Senator Sanders and uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez introduced um, the Fracking Ban Act earlier this year at the federal level that would prohibit fracking nationally. But this particular instance with the congruence of the, the pandemic, the oil price war, and then the plunge in prices, but also the plunge in um, the value of all oil and gas companies across the board provides an opening and an opportunity for uh, a new push, which is to, instead of bailing out oil and gas industries, buying them out. And there are issues, like you mentioned, about mineral rights and, and, and other things, but the idea is right now, the federal government could take equity stakes in these companies and Unlike when we bailed out the auto industry and the Obama administration was very explicit in that they would not be taking control of the companies that they had equity in. The idea here is we would take public control of these companies so that we could have a managed phase out of their production in a way that also protects the communities that they're in and the workers who depend on those jobs for their, their income. 
And this has actually blown up as a, you know, there, there's been conversations about this, but this has really blow, blown up recently within the environmental community as a much more um, active conversation. We uh, came out uh, in favor of this policy uh, of just a few weeks ago, actually, um, and have been having conversations with um, allies from the labor movement to the environmental movement uh, to, you know, government reform advocates, um, you know, talking about how public control of the energy sector is now much more of a possibility in light of the current crises that are, are uh, intersecting with each other. You know, that's interesting that you say that because I've been working with Californians for Energy Choice about uh, taking over PG&E. Right. Um, this is a group that formed to support uh, community choice aggregators, which is different from mm -hmm. public ownership. But right. we um, are saying with, with PG&E going bankrupt, with everybody being upset with them, including the governor, and the only proposals on the table being by the stockholders and the bondholders, both of which are hedge fund proposals, uh, are not acceptable. So we were talking about, um, you know, the state taking it over or taking over the national, the state transmission lines and giving the local uh, um, operations to either CCAs or municipalities if they wanted to do it. But Scott Weiner, who actually was going to carry a bill on that, now that's all put on hold because the state legislatures are dealing with, you know, how are they going to get the revenues, you know, and fighting with, with Trump to get what they need. Um, you know, I would like to see this happen on the federal level, but as we can see, because of what you were saying, Winona, Trump is going in the other direction. Instead of talking about, you know, buying the oil companies, he's talking about, you know, bailing them out. Do either of you have any closing comments you want to make before I end the show? Very excited about um, all of the work that we're going to continue to do, whether there is the virus or not. And I think that there's a, a lot that we can continue to get done even when we're on lockdown. Well, thank you both very much. And, thank you, um, Lauren. And I hope you're doing well under these uh, challenging circumstances. Yes, I am. Thank you. And you too. Stay safe, stay home, and keep fighting. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Thanks.